Okay, I won't lie. I've spoken enough today. If you've got your Bibles, we're in Luke, Luke chapter 24, 13 to 35. Luke 24, 13 to 35. Now, us human beings are really good at pattern recognition uh, and cementing those patterns into simplified stories that lock thinking into communicable ways that help the world run. In other words, we love patterns that we turn into stories. That's our jam. A weird example about this is pareidolia. Big words tonight. Pareidolia is if you go outside tonight if there's still clouds and look up at the clouds, you don't see clouds. You see lions and bears and tigers. I mean, the weirdest example of this is the Greeks and the shapes of things in the stars. It's like, yo, that totally looks like a crab. I'm like, no, that looks like a stick creature. Come on. Yeah. But that's pareidolia. I mean, it's a, it's a weird one, but that's our brain making patterns and connecting them. And it's, it's kind of a fun one. A more strange one, though, is something called uncanny valley. Uncanny valley is the idea that we pick up when something does not fit. So it happens mostly today in um, in robots in these super realistic robots that people put on display but something is wrong about them it's the way that they don't blink or you know something that they, they move in weird directions or like they walk down a passage in a weird way no i'm just joking <laughs> uh, it, it, they look weird and instantly our body says something doesn't fit and we get the heebie-jeebies right you might have this in a situation where you're walking and someone walks past you and there's just something wrong about them. That's that sense that your body goes into this like, something's wrong here. Well, that's not woman intuition. It's not superpowers. It's just your amazing God-given ability to recognize patterns. That's what we do. Now, the tendency we have, though, is to lay these patterns so heavily onto something that we connect things that are not connected and say, this totally makes sense. In fact, this is the definition of a conspiracy. A conspiracy is different points of information connected by a narrative. Now, these are dangerous. And sometimes, like we will see tonight, we completely miss the obvious. Because we are entrenched with patterns, entrenched with systems. So let's see what happens with the disciples in our story tonight in Luke 24, verse 13 to 35. We read there. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What's more, it's the third day since all this took place. And in addition, some woman, some of our women, amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, and they didn't find his body. They came and told us, that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. Then, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish are you, and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things in order to enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in and stayed with them. 
When he was at the table, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up early, uh, sorry, they got up and returned to Jerusalem at, uh, at once. And there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together saying, It is true, the Lord has risen, he has appeared to Simon. Then the two that were happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them, by them when he broke bread. May the Lord bless the reading of his word tonight. Now, Luke is the only one of the Gospels that shares this story. It is important for Luke's narrative, and in fact, it is important for the Luke-Acts narrative uh, part of his story. But Luke puts this in his story because he is trying to show the church that we have a tendency of not seeing Jesus as he is, not seeing him as the risen Lord. And this is the first point, expectations and disappointments. The disciples on this road were shattered. They were done, disappointed that Jesus had not turned out to be who they had expected him to be. This is what's their conversation on the road. As they were walking, they were discussing everything that had happened and how the woman had had this story that they had come up with. And you can imagine the debates going forward, back and forth between these two men. Like, ah, these women, I don't believe them. I don't know, there's some validity. I mean, they seem very excited. Nah, it's woman, and whatever. Yeah, and it's back and forth, back and forth. All the information and discussions, like today, like when we have discussions, I always love like sitting down with people, especially like you know, just a group of people, and they're discussing things, and everyone's an expert, you know. When the uh, um, uh, Ukraine war happened, everyone was an expert, and suddenly Israel happened, and everyone was an expert. And the conversations happen like that. They flow. And we haven't a clue what we're talking about. Well, this was, must have been happening. And the problem was they were interpreting all these events from the perspective that the Messiah would be a political figure who would usher in a golden age for the Jewish people. Now, we look at that and say, how did they miss it? But do yourself a favor. Read through the Old Testament. I mean, like, really read through it. And see how painfully obvious that interpretation of the Messiah was. It was obvious to them. In fact, this whole idea that the Messiah would suffer and die like Jesus was a complete mystery. No one was expecting it. There were some who were like, the Messiah is coming, but we don't know what it's going to be like. It was a mystery. On a side point, this is for free. This is exactly how eschatology is, the end times. I think it's a mystery by design. Anyway, that's just for free. Just think about that. Um, but it was locked into a mystery for one simple reason. There's intelligent evil forces. If it was all plain and written out, guess what? They had read the Bible. So God locked it into a mystery to keep it a mystery so that they would be humiliated and the Messiah would win. You see, their preconceived ideas of the Messiah kept them from actually seeing Jesus as he was. I mean, they said it. He had all the marks of being God's king. He was good. He was sinless. He was a miracle worker. He was powerful before men and gods. He had all the marks, but he died. And in their mind, that was a deal breaker, which is kind of obvious. Like, how do you rule Jerusalem dead? It's, like, it's not, like, it's not, that they, were, they were thinking right. They weren't out of their mind. The disciples expected the fall of the pagan empires, especially Rome. They expected the destruction of the idols. That the Jews would rule the world through Messiah. I mean, Genesis 49, verse 10, listen to this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. That's the ruling rod. Or the, ruler, or the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be obedience, or the obedience, of all the people. That hadn't happened. Jesus had died. You can see how they could read a strong Messiah from that. A, a Messiah who would not die. 
but locked into the messianic prophecies were hundreds of prophecies that the, the Messiah would suffer. In fact, one could say that it's due to this overwhelming expectation of this strong ruler that it was obvious that they did not know that the man walking next to him, to them, was actually Jesus. Which is our second point. They were blinded to the truth. I mean, let's just ask an obvious question. If you spend three years with someone, and that's a loose figure, and they start walking next to you on a road, how do you miss that? Like, you know, let's have a... Many of you have been on this journey through Luke, and some of you have actually sat through almost every sermon, which is a mind blow. I'm just saying that. It's been like almost three years. It's been two and a bit. Now, say I die, and you're walking out the church, and suddenly I walk next to you. You'd be like, you would see me, right? It wouldn't be like, oh, no, it can't be Barry. You wouldn't like, uh, it's pretty obvious. So how did they miss it? Well, the Bible says, they were kept from recognizing. Verse 16. In fact, Luke masterfully exposes how all would come to the risen Christ post-resurrection. They would be blinded to Him. They wouldn't see Him as He is because seeing is not believing. As I said last week, the resurrection is kind of unbelievable. And so if you're looking to see Jesus through facts, there's nothing wrong with facts. The Bible is full of facts. But if that's how you're going to see Him, you've got the wrong perspective. You're going to miss him. Because you're going to get into a confrontation with your own desire of what you want Jesus to be and who he really is. For the disciples, they didn't believe that someone dead could rise from the dead. They couldn't see him because they couldn't believe that this would happen. In fact, we see two things. Firstly, we don't know actually how Jesus came to them, how he appeared to them. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit. But secondly, why would anyone who watched Jesus die expect to see him again? Something called cognitive bias. If you see something completely unbelievable, your brain says, ain't happening. It's just not there. I'm not seeing this. It refuses to. Because it's unbelievable. Now going back to my first point. Jesus was now resurrected. He wasn't the Jesus they knew. He was now glorified. Filled with power. He was the same, but fundamentally changed. One example of this. They recognize Him and He disappears. That's not humanish. I don't know. None of you have disappeared on me just yet. I'm worried about some of you. We haven't been in church for a while, but you know, we, you don't vanish in the blink of an eye. But this is the reality. Jesus had transferred from human to glorified human. He wasn't temporal anymore. He was eternal. He was human, but truly human as no human has ever been. Finally, their preconceptions of Jesus would have absolutely kept them from perceiving Jesus for who He is. And here's where I want to make a point. I've made it already, but I'll make it again. You don't miss Jesus for lack of information. You miss Jesus because you don't come to Him as He needs to be come to. As He asks you to come. And this leads us to the third point, seeing the resurrected Jesus. When do the disciples recognize Jesus? When he breaks the bread. And this is not accidental. Luke is trying to show us something fundamental about how we recognize Jesus. We recognize Jesus around the breaking of bread. Now what do I mean there? Luke twice in this passage states how they recognized Jesus when he broke bread. And so let's ask a question, church. 
What comes to mind when we say the breaking of bread? The communion, right? What is the communion? The Lord's Supper. What is this? What is Luke trying to communicate? Because meals and meal theology is important to Luke. He runs us through the whole book of Acts. It would be a meal, church, instituted by Jesus. That would be the marker of a fledgling church as it's spread around the world. The communion would mark the early church. But what was the communion? It's not just a supper. It's not just a time to have a little cracker and a half little glass of grape juice as we have in this church. It's so much deeper. Paul in 1 Corinthians says, For I see from the Lord what I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that He was betrayed took bread and when He gave thanks He broke it and said, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Luke is saying, You know how we come to Jesus? We see him in the broken reality in the gospel in the Lord's death church it's the gospel that unlocks the scriptures it is death and the resurrection of Jesus that enables us when we look deeply into it to see him as he is I'm going to throw this out there if you're missing Jesus it's because you're not coming to him as he is You're still trying to come to Him maybe on moral virtue. You're still trying to come to Him, trying to figure Him out. You're still trying to come to Him, getting Him on your side. And how does He demand that you come to Him? Through the Gospel. Come as you are. Broken. And let Him embrace you. Church, this becomes the marker of the early church indeed. The only marker of the true church throughout history. It's as the gospel is proclaimed that the church is established. It's as the gospel is proclaimed that people meet the risen Jesus. It's the gospel that God sent Jesus to live and die for sinners. And He rose again on the third day. That proclamation is the reality of the church. It's the reality of how we come and know Jesus. And this meal marks that throughout history. It's not a repetition of actions. It's a constant reminder that we ourselves need Him. We need Him. Can I confess something to you tonight? Tonight, sorry, I've been speaking for too long. You know how often I convince myself that I don't need Jesus? How I walk along in my life and just carry on like He doesn't matter. Like, I can do this. Until I hit the brick wall. And then I turn around like a dumb kid that's trying to you know, cook by themselves. And I'm like, Dad, I need help. And Jesus says, yeah, exactly. Let's try again. Picks me up off the ground. And I guarantee the struggles you are facing at the moment. You're not coming to Jesus as he would be found. You're still running your own race. You're still making up your own story. And that's the point. It's not your story. It's His. So meet Him on the road. Participate in Him. Not in your actions. And as we do that, as we again worship Him through the gospel, as we participate in this reminder that we need, church, do not our hearts strangely burn within us? And we recognize that this is what we have been longing for our entire lives. One last point, and then I'll close. We even do this in Scripture. How many of us read a story like the story of David? 
and think, oh, I wish I had the courage of David. I wish I had the strength of Samson, you know? I wish I had the wisdom of Solomon. And you miss Jesus in the Scriptures. I hate to break it to you, but the Bible is not about David, Solomon, or Samson. It's not about Moses. It's not about Ezekiel. It's not about Elijah. From start to finish, it is one story. And that story is that we need Jesus. You don't have the courage of David. Thank God for that. Because you have Jesus. You don't have the strength of Samson. Thank God for that because you have Jesus. Are you starting to get it? Are you starting to see Him? That's where He wants to be met. Let's pray. That I think I speak for every single one of us, even this week. We've missed you because we're seeking for you in where you will not be found. In our own merit, in our own striving, in our own dreams, in our own plans. And Lord, as we step out of that mire and muck of the mess we've made, we run to the risen Jesus again. And thank you that you will not turn us aside. You will never reject us. You will never abandon us. Your mercies are new every morning. And your faithfulness is as far as the earth is from the sky. And so Lord, let us come again to you and find you where you be found.